All right, let's start this video with this. This is Doom. But Doom like you've never seen it before. It's technically known as Quantum, or I guess Quantum Computer Doom. This version, created by Luke Mortimer, a quantum computing researcher from Barcelona, recreates the first level of the iconic shooter, but in this case pretending as if it was basically running on a quantum computer. So it's not running on a real quantum computer, but it's running on a simulator known as QASM simulator. Or technically, Quasm simulator. You can find the link for this in the description. And the reason it's not running on a real computer is because this requires a lot of qubits. Approximately 72,000 qubits and 80 million gates just to execute this basic code. And as of a few months ago, the largest quantum computer is by IBM and it only has approximately 1100 qubits. So we definitely have ways to go. But in this case, it does translate classical instructions to quantum instructions by using this Quasm simulator. And so you can actually even run this on a typical computer, but don't expect much performance. Because apparently, not only do you need approximately 6 GB of RAM, but it also obviously has no music, no sound, no colors, and everything here looks monochromatic. And the reason I wanted to show you this is because it really kind of demonstrates where we currently are with quantum computing and how the field itself is still in its early infancy. As a matter of fact, when back in 2019 IBM announced this, Quantum System 1, a groundbreaking 20 qubit computer that was supposed to change the world, one of the first questions everyone was asking was, yeah, but can it actually run Crisis? And the obvious answer is no, no it can't. It won't even be able to run Doom. And a quantum computer powerful enough to run this game may not exist for a very long time. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton. In this video we're going to discuss some of the more recent updates and some of the more recent announcements in regards to quantum computing and actually focus on one specific study that recently discovered there is a way to make quantum computers sort of similar to a typical desktop, and that by itself could lead us somewhere. But first, let's discuss some of the advances in the last few years, and why even after 5 years since the announcement by IBM, and all of these grandiose announcements by Google, there is really still nothing we have that's practical or useful. And in the last few years, there's been a lot of claims about so many things. For example, back in 2019, Google officially announced that it's basically achieved quantum supremacy. It created a quantum computer able to outperform any classical computer we had back then. But this was basically a kind of an advertisement, because within just a few years, researchers already created a new algorithm that could use classical computers to pretty much beat any quantum computer by a huge margin. And even though back then Google claimed that even a powerful supercomputer would actually take 10,000 years to complete similar calculations, it took just 3 years for the researchers to discover that there was a way to change algorithms to make classical computers just as fast. In other words, there was definitely no supremacy. And this kind of a back and forth between classical computers or researchers using classical computers and companies like IBM and Google that are trying to promote quantum computers has been basically going on for at least 5 years. But there's always been a much more important issue. Even today, based on these announcements, many people believe that quantum computers are basically going to appear anytime now. But qubits are very very sensitive and they can be easily disrupted by anything. This is often referred to as decoherence. And because of this, as quantum computers become more and more complex, it becomes progressively more challenging to actually conduct any operations without creating too many errors. And so even today it's a little bit uncertain if we'll ever even get enough qubits to run this simple game. With decoherence in this case being the first issue. In case you don't actually understand what this means, well it's basically why you and I are not really quantum objects. Because our particles interact with everything else around them, they're not able to form quantum entanglement. But in a typical quantum computer, you have to have hundreds of qubits entangled to one another in order to make these computers function. But any simple disturbance basically destroys the entanglement, making these computers lose everything. And so to conduct complex operations inside a quantum computer, we have to find a way to entangle many qubits all at once, which as scientists discovered in the last few years is ridiculously hard. For example, one technique that's often used to remedy this is known as NISC, noisy intermediate scale quantum technique that tries to gather information from a lot of qubits, hoping that at least a few of them will stay entangled. But even there, we're not even close to making this functional or useful. And that's problem number one. Then there is problem number two, and that's a much more important problem. Even after years and years of search, there are no actual calculations so far 
that can be effectively done on a quantum computer that can then be used in real world. For example, one type of a calculation that quantum computers do really well is known as boson sampling. It measures a sample of photons, very often using mirrors and a lot of lasers, and normally a classical computer is actually not really good at doing this very quick. But a quantum computer like the light solver you see right here is really good at this task. The problem is that it doesn't really have any practical use yet. And it's not because people are not smart enough to figure it out. They just really cannot find a way to use this in any meaningful way. For example, there was this one study you can find in any description that tried to apply boson sampling to various graphing problems. And that's of course something that is useful and could technically be used in things like, for example, deep learning or artificial intelligence. But in reality, so far, it's just a bunch of hopes. The conclusion here was that it might be possible to perform certain calculations and solve certain graphing problems, but in reality, the classical computers are still going to be much, much better and much faster. In other words, the conclusion was that there was absolutely no reason for a quantum computer. With additional studies trying to find a use in, for example, particle colliders such as CERN, where various quantum effects do appear all the time. But no practical solution has been discovered yet, and so as of 2024, quantum computers remain in a bit of a limbo. It's great on paper, it's just we don't really know what to do with them. But it's not all doom and gloom. As a matter of fact, there might be at least two potential uses. And one of them was revealed by these wonderful people from the Leibniz University Hanover. And here this was one of the first tests of what we usually would refer to as a quantum internet. Essentially an experiment that combined quantum information with classical information, but by using typical optical fibers that internet providers already use. And so here, by using a relatively new technique known as Zerodyne Frequency Translator, they were able to modulate the photons inside the cable, transmitting photons that were also entangled, but entangled inside a regular optical cable. And so here, by combining classical data and quantum data, they actually demonstrated a possibility for an extremely secure way of communication. And that's because quantum internet would be basically hack-proof. We've actually discussed some of the previous experiments from China in one of the videos in the description, but this works in a very simple way. If no one is listening, and if no one is intercepting these signals, these signals are going to be constantly entangled, and the data is going to flow without interruption. But if a third party tries to hack into this and tries to listen to them, we get decoherence, quantum entanglement collapses, and the entire signal is disrupted, notifying both parties that basically someone is listening. And so in some sense, that's maybe one practical use, but in this case it uses a slightly different technology and slightly different quantum computers. These are known as the optical quantum computers. And when it comes to optical quantum computers, there actually might be use after all, and we might even have our first breakthrough. It's coming from a study by two Taiwanese researchers that basically implements the so-called Shor's algorithm inside a single photon quantum computer. In case you're not familiar, Shor's algorithm, developed by the famous Peter Shor, is usually used in quantum computers for finding the prime factors inside an integer. So it's a basic mathematical calculation. And back in 2001, this algorithm was demonstrated on one of the first IBM computers containing 7 qubits by factoring number 15 into 3 and 5. And something very similar has now been achieved by the team from the National Tsinghua University. They have just created this the world's smallest quantum computer, but more importantly, a computer that can run in room temperatures and is made out of a single photon. And in this case, they were able to once again show the proof of concept. They conducted a mathematical operation, discovering the prime numbers inside the number 15. But what makes this computer different is that instead of having many qubits that obviously add to complexity and the potential for decoherence, here they found a way to store all of the information inside so-called time bins or dimensions inside a single photon. Or just to rephrase this, they found a way to store 32 bits of information within a single wave packet formed by one laser. And though we obviously have much larger computers containing hundreds of lasers, here by using just one and instead creating dimensions inside of it, they found a way to create a really stable quantum computer that can literally just rest on your desk. But this was just a proof of concept and just the first demonstration. Next step is to make this larger by adding even more dimensions and thus allowing this to have more complex calculations. But here we're still back to that original problem. What is this really for? And well, a separate study that was just released not so long ago 
potentially explains how this could be used. And here this is basically for cracking encryption. One of the oldest and one of the most widely used cryptography systems is known as RSA. And one of the recent studies you can find in the description basically found a bunch of ways to use quantum computers to start attacking this encryption by for example using D-Wave quantum computers created by a Canadian company called D-Wave. And so in this study they basically demonstrate that it's possible to create an optimization problem that can start factoring large integers with the results demonstrating a factoring of a 22-bit integer using D-Wave Advantage quantum computer. And it basically looks something like this. And by blending this technique with classical techniques, they discover that they can even crack 50-bit integers, which indicates that with time, it might be possible to break pretty much any key. And so by demonstrating that you can actually factor prime numbers using some of the widely available quantum computers, here this was one of the first studies indicating that eventually quantum computers may impact security after all. Now it hasn't happened yet, and we're definitely still far away from that, so you know, don't worry, your bitcoins are safe, but the question is, for how long? But in essence, this is the current state of quantum computing. It might be useful for breaking into things, it might also be useful for protecting the internet and communication, but right now it's not really useful for a lot of other stuff. As a matter of fact, there's an entire study right here that tried to summarize a lot of different quantum achievements and find any way we can use this in, for example, the field of physics. In essence, trying to find applications in both theoretical and experimental physics by using these quantum advantages. And though quite a lot of ideas are explored, and the researchers still believe there is maybe some promise, the overall conclusion is that there are just so many limitations in current quantum hardware, and things like noise or qubit count is just not going to have a solution anytime soon. And so the overall conclusion is that there might be some promise, like in years or technically decades to come, just don't expect it anytime soon. And that's where we're at with quantum computing as of the end of 2024. Now I'm sure I actually missed quite a lot of different discoveries and a lot of different announcements, and we might discuss them in some of the future videos, but overall, as of today, quantum computing is still stuck in a bit of a limbo. It's an exciting and intriguing field, and definitely makes us question the reality, but when it comes to practical application, well, classical computers, like the ones you're watching this on, still win. But we'll definitely talk more about this in some of the future videos. Also, check out previous videos on quantum computers in some of the links in the description. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support the channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.